Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the How To Academy. My name is David Malone. Um, it's my great pleasure this evening to talk to Siddhartha Ribeiro. Evening, Siddhartha. Um, Siddhartha is the founder of the Brain Institute at the Universidad Federal de Rio Grande do Norte, um, and has also written that book, The Oracle of Night, The History and Science of Dreams. Um, it's a big book, Siddhartha, in every sense of the word. I mean, it, you, you range across a huge range of topics, but I, I couldn't help but notice, recently we have talked to both Mark Solms and Stick, um, Stickgold, there is, is there not, something really exciting going on at that place where brain research, dream research, is saying something about consciousness, a, a kind of a reevaluation of, of what dreams can contribute to our understanding of consciousness, the self, and even how history is unfolded. Am I right? There's something really big going on, isn't there? Absolutely. Uh, good evening to everyone watching. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And absolutely, David, uh, I think that for nearly 100 years, dreaming has been uh, ostracized from serious scientific discourse. And this is definitely changed. This has changed already in, in, the, in, in several fields in neuroscience and psychology. But I think now the public is becoming aware of it. And in your, your book, you, you, you look at how you can trace what dreams have contributed, or, or better, the, the underlying mechanisms of the brain that are involved in dreams. You, you sort of trace the influence they've had through human history, that, that, that dreams and the things underlying dreams have really had an effect and continue to today. Isn't that true? Yes, with, with the, the comments that in, in the past, say, 500 years, this influence is, is becoming less and less important. So if we look to the past or if we look to contemporary uh, hunter-gatherer societies, you'll see that dreaming is at the center of social life. And it's also at the center of, the, of private life. And this is not so in our society. And, and, and part, perhaps part of, part of our problems today have to do with our rupture with dreaming. Mm. Yes, I mean, you, you make this very simple point, which is we have been dreaming creatures right from the beginning of being human creatures. Um, so it's, it's not something which... It's not like the froth on the top of your beer, where it's just, it's there, but it's of no importance and has no substance. You, you're very clearly saying that whatever this thing is, it's been at the root of what it is to be human. Absolutely. To, to have dreams, to share dreams, this is very important, to bring your dreams uh, to, to the community. Uh, this was the center of the, the innovation process. It's still so in, 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 for example, among the Yanomami in, in the Amazon. So, so new ideas, new strategies, adaptation comes from dreaming and from, from interpretation of, dream, of dreams uh, that involve the family and the community. The fact that we don't have this at all is, is probably linked to our lack of insights into the future. Because what I argue in the book is that dreaming is about simulating possible futures. This is not apparent uh, in our lives now, but if we look towards the, the past, if we look towards other species that seem to have dreaming going on, in, in among mammals in particular, then we see that this neurobiological machine of creating counterfactuals, of creating possible scenarios, is something that we should not live without. This something we should not relinquish this to, to uh, uh, a habit of the past. We should rescue dreaming, and we should do this both at the private level, but also at the public level, at the public scenario. I wonder if, if we would be enduring the, the shame of Trump and, uh, quite honestly, Boris Johnson, if we, we had more insight into the future. Well, we certainly need some better dreams. Certainly we do in yes. this country. Yes. We need a better dream of ourselves, I think, here. I can't speak for your country, but here we need a better dream of ourselves. In our country, more, more, even more so than in, our, in your country. <laughs> um, a terrible leader. <laughs> you, you, th this notion of the, 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 the importance of dreams and that it's linked to the self, 
Um, you make a there's, a, there's a lovely quote, um, it's quite a long way into the book. You say the subliminal self is not inferior to the conscious self. Um, I thought that was a lovely insight that there's a, there's a, there's a, a part of what the self is, which if I've understood what you're writing is, it's not the sort of the, the, the rational bit of the self, the, the bit of the self that marches around all day and thinks it's in charge and talks about how it must pay the electricity bill and go to the shops, but an older, deeper, more, um, I don't know what the right word is. Intuitive. But it's a intuitive. Uh -huh. Tell us it's about it. Intuition. It's about collecting fragments of, of stimuli that individually can, does, do not cross the threshold of awareness. But then when, when many of those elements are gathered, uh, they can coalesce into, for example, an image that, that tells you very clearly what's going on. Uh, the late Jonathan Winston, one of the pioneers of, of the research, uh, of the neurobiological research of dreaming uh, at Rockefeller University, uh, he used to say, dream, dreams are what, they represent what's going on in your life right now. Now, they may represent it quite literally. They may represent it in a very complex manner because, in fact, you're facing too many challenges. So it's a, it's a mix of problems that doesn't seem like a unity. But sometimes when you have a big problem, they will really, really express that problem and possible solutions to the problem. I think this is the most critical thing. If, if we lose the, the perspective that dreaming has to do with adaptation, we, we, we think that, they, that dreams are the spanners of sleep. But it's really not so. And, and there's so many examples throughout history. And now in, in current neuroscience, in current psychology, it's so obvious that, that dreaming has to, has to be taken. We need to reappraise dreaming. Dreaming is not, uh, as you said, it's not the froth on top of the, of the, of the, of the drink. It's, it's actually at the foundation. And it's at the foundation of cultural accumulation. It's at the foundation of the creation of culture. Yes. Uh, it's part of the problem of doing this interview with you is in that one sentence, you've opened up two enormous and different avenues which we could go down. Um, let's, let's talk about um, the, the point that, that dreams are um, a way of thinking, a, a, that they're a, a way of evaluating things. And it's not just um, like the, the Walt Disney sort of one image pops up and there's Goofy riding a tricycle and then there's someone juggling over here. It's not like that. And you, you, you draw attention to the fact that you can think of three different ways in which we think. We can think there's inductive, there's deductive, I think it was, and then abduction. Now, tell us what you mean by those three things. And, and the, the abduction is the one that we've forgotten. Yes, yes. So we, of course, we learn by experience, we learn by induction, by learning things factually, one by one in a very safe manner, but also, you know, quite limited, right? But we can make inductions based on this, this sort of, of encounter with reality. We can have uh, assumptions that generate consequences and we can deduce uh, what should be true based on those assumptions. But we can also imagine likely explanations for things. Right, and this is what abduction does. And, 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 and dreaming is, is, is one of the most exquisite ways of abduction, right? You can, you can come up with solutions that you're looking for in a quite graphic manner. I think, for example, the, the, the discovery of the periodic table by Mendeleev. So he was dealing with, he knew that there should be some organization. He had little cards that had the, 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 the different elements written there. And then in a dream, he's, they moved around and they, they coalesced into uh, 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 an image that made sense. I think it has to do with producing images and producing narratives that makes emotional sense, that make um, rational sense in your daily life. So it's not really enough to have a dream, but you need to bring it back. You need to be able to, to, to remember it first and then share it with other people. I mean, if Mendeleev had had the dream and not told other people about the consequences of the dream, we, none of us would have had it in, in, in high school. Um, so, and, and I think the, the fact that science and art uh, still uh, drink and eat a lot from dreaming, but this is not talked about. We don't, we don't, we don't discuss this as a, as a legitimate way of, of having insight, of, of acquiring insight. And it's fool, foolish to not do that. It's just foolish to, to, to not use this power towards our benefit. But, but I think most importantly, towards 
collective benefits. I think uh, one criticism that some uh, indigenous uh, leaders, uh, shamans, uh, make uh, about the, the Western contemporary world, let's say Eurocentric world, is that when dreaming goes on and when, when people can remember their dreams, it's usually a dream about only about themselves. It's not a dream about the common good a sh of, of a shared future. And our ancestors wouldn't have survived the Paleolithic. If, if they didn't have this ability to not just produce new ideas, because the new ideas cannot come when you're facing a harsh reality. They need to come when you're relaxed. They need to come when you are safe in, 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 in your home and in a cave, and, and you can either night dream or daydream. And, and, and the fact that we lost this perspective is very telling, in fact, of the paradox that we live now, where we never had so many and so powerful means of changing reality. Technologically, we are at the, at the apex of, of anything we can dream of. And still, 99% of the people in the world are, are, you know, are not sure about the future. <laughs> they don't know what's going on. 99% of the people in the world had the decrease in income uh, during the pandemic. And 1% uh, actually increased, right? The, the 10 billionaires in the world, they, they doubled their, their wealth they seem to lack imagination. <laughs> and, and this lack of imagination seems to be, in my opinion, very much related to, our, uh, to us relinquishing dreaming to, to something that is actually embarrassing. People are afraid of talking about their dreams. They don't share dreams often with their family and much less so in the workplace or in schools. And this is not the case if you look towards Native Americans, if you look towards Aboriginal peoples, and if you look towards ancient Greeks, ancient uh, Egypt, Egyptians and Sumerians and so on, we'll see that there was nothing of importance that didn't have dreams uh, in the middle. Mm. But I mean, we don't even have to look that far. There are examples in, in our own culture where uh, I'm thinking of um, um, Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream. Yes. He, he yeah. didn't say I had, I had a good idea. He said right. I have a dream. Right. And it, it, it gets to this, uh, something else you wrote about abduction, which I, I think is worth saying because it, it, you said that you could abduction is when you can you you grasp the whole idea without necessarily understanding all of its details and for me i've it, it struck a, a chord with me because when i think I've, of ideas i think in very concrete terms i think of it as standing on a hill and looking out and i can see i can see a mountain in the distance and i can see a valley between me for instance i don't know what's in the valley but it doesn't matter the the new idea is that mountain in the distance and I can see it even though I haven't been there yet and in a way that's what Martin Luther King's I have a dream is he had Absolutely. a broad notion he didn't know exactly how we we're going to get there and and as you say that was a collective dream it wasn't I have a dream I'm gonna win the lottery tomorrow it was it was a collective dream absolutely, absolutely. I, I think it's hard for us to appreciate that we wouldn't have survived if our ancestors wouldn't have survived then we wouldn't be here if we were not so good at working collectively. A, a single human alone in the forest is dead in 10 days or less, right? Or 10 minutes <laughs> in some cases. And so we need other people to survive. And this, this, this idea that we can be completely isolated, that our families have to be very small, that we will not share things even within the family is a quite weird idea. And it's an idea that led us to a state in which even people that, that have good salaries are quite unsure about the future because they cannot rely on others. They do, they do not trust that others will be there for them. So we created a very crazy society that, that cultivates money as a god and in which the people that have the most money, they tend not to share it, but rather to use it to accumulate more. This is lack of insight. This is lack of imagination of a vision for the future. Right? And I'm not blaming it all on the lack of dreaming. We have other things going on, of course. But the lack of dreaming, as you said before, because it's so foundational for, for culture making, must be part of the problem, part of, a big part of why we seem to be in a trap. In a trap. So if we keep uh, and, uh, speeding up the development of, of the economy, the, the environment will collapse. And if we slow down, the society will collapse. This seems like, a, it seems to me, it seems like we're drowning in a, in a glass of water. Because if we just stopped and we just shared more, there would be plenty for everybody. 
the, if the nine, if the one percent uh, richest just shared half of what they have, they wouldn't, they wouldn't eat, uh, you know, less caviar, or they wouldn't have less champagne, or they wouldn't travel less. Th their lives wouldn't change at all. But the lives of millions of people would change. And the fact that we still don't grasp it, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure that our Paleolithic ancestors knew that the strongest, the, the, the strongest uh, ones needed to take care of the of the weak. Uh, individuals and there's evidence of this kind of care of an ethics of care from very early on you know dating back to the, to the upper paleolithic and and i think that dreams are the kind of thing that tell you this to tell you when you are that when you should do more to towards somebody that is vulnerable to tell you when you are acting wrong to tell you what are the consequences of our of your actions i give you a, a very trivial example uh, once I, I, I tell it in the book. Once I, I, I was I was a student. I was doing uh, my my PhD studies in New York, and I, sh I I signed up for a car to use to go to the field center. I had an experiment to do there, and then when I got there at seven a.m., the car wasn't there. The student that took it the day before didn't come back, and I was really angry because he didn't tell me anything, and I I basically lost my day of, of of experiments. And then during the day, I was I was rehearsing what I would say to him. And he was all quite harsh. Then at night, I had a dream in which I faced him and I scolded him and he, beat, he, he beats me up badly. And he's a big guy, strong guy. And then in the next day, when I woke up feeling the emotion of, of having a physical confrontation with him, and then when I actually met him, I was quite polite. <laughs> and he was quite polite as well. I think this is an example of a... Of a of a simulation of a possible future and of, uh, and of how behavior gets to change in response to the dream so as to change this future. Mm. It's, it's, it's a, a theme that runs beautifully through the whole book is this relationship of dreaming to past and future. And, and in a way you make dreams very central to our ability to live outside of just the moment we're in and, and look both to past and future. And you have a lovely phrase um, where you say, that the the dreaming mind is um blind i think it's you say is blind to the future but very wise about the past and yes. i thought that was very a very clever thing thank you i i think that what dreams are uh, they evolved because they were able to couple past and future so by revisiting the past and with more freedom because of actually for neurochemical reasons that we can talk about that. Why, why is it that it, during, in particular, rapid eye movement sleep, the second half of the night, why is it that the brain will, will pass electrical activity from one neuron to another with more freedom? But, but, but there's, there are quite specific and pragmatic reasons why this is so. And because this is so, it means that we can reappraise the past and look for possibilities that are not obvious, and then on the next day, consider it. So, so in the example that I gave, I, I woke up in the morning and said, oh, so if I'm harsh with this guy, he may beat me up. And that was something that had not crossed my mind before during the waking time. And so it just allowed me to see one possible consequence of my acts. And if we go back to the billionaires, I'm sure if they were dreaming more and pay more attention to their dreams, they probably would have, because the, the unconscious, this, this mass... Uh, collection of memories that we are not aware of at this particular moment, it will, it will bring to your attention things that you're not noticing. For example, there are, pe there are people dying there. Maybe I shouldn't try to be richer. 